15 this morning. Um, some bills have gone to Janet's, uh, Governor Mills' desk. I believe at the rules have gone to her desk also. I'm That's looking what I at you that yeah. I understand uh, on marijuana regulations. So we're sort of. We haven't read them yet. Yeah, we haven't <laughs> seen them or whatever. But anyway, that being said, so what I'm going to ask is how we're going to run this. I'm going to have Phil explain what's going on as far as we know and he knows um, what he would like to see because. The purpose of this is to get some testimony, get some input from folks. Um, I did get about six emails uh, from people who couldn't attend this afternoon. <clears throat> We're going to take all of this down, and then Phil's going to go back and over the summer draft some potential ordinances uh, for the town. So that's our, our purpose today. All right? Um, Phil, if you wouldn't mind... Do you want to do these first? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, call to order. So I'll officially call us to order. I'm so used to running business meetings that I don't have to go through this. And the roll call. I'm here. Are you here? I'm here. Okay. Councilor, Councilor Foley's Councilor here. Hamill. Here. <laughs> Councilor Foley. Here. Councilor Caterina. Yes, I'm here. Uh, approval of the minutes from May 23rd. So moved. Second. All in favor? All right. Mr. Sauce here. So I'll just do a, a very brief overview. I think a number of people have already heard this, have been at other meetings. Um, but very briefly, as you know, both medical marijuana and what is now called adult use marijuana are legal in the state. Last year, the legislature did a significant rewrite of both of those two laws, which were originally both enacted through uh, citizen initiative. Um, and uh, so those they were significantly rewritten. Um, the uh, Adult use law went into effect back in May of last year, um, and um, uh, what it did is it set out, uh, sort of clarified what already existed, but four categories of types of commercial establishments um, uh, that could exist um, uh, if a community wanted them, and those are uh, uh, testing facilities, manufacturing facilities, retail stores, and cultivation facilities. Cultivation facilities is then further um, into, into different categories based on essentially size. Um, it, what it did is, uh, and I'll just be briefly in medical because the, the, the municipal regulation component is almost identical for each. On the medical side, um, again, four categories, um, one difference. There's uh, testing facilities, manufacturing facilities, registered dispensaries, which we're already mm -hmm. somewhat familiar with in the state at least, and then uh, recognize but it's sort of already been happening which is something called registered caregiver retail stores that was not addressed in the old version of the law they were starting to show up storefronts mm -hmm. so it uh, but the law specifically recognized them and said they're allowed again under both laws um, only if the community wants them they call it the opt-in that flipped the presumption that was in the law beforehand so a community would have had to have opted out if they didn't want them. And that's why you saw a number of uh, moratoria around the state as at least communities that maybe even wanted them, but they wanted to get a handle on how they wanted to regulate them. So you saw a lot of moratoria or you saw some opt-outs happening. These laws are now opt-in. So if you don't want them and you haven't done anything, you don't have to do anything. It's and that's for quote. all of them? All, all eight categories, the adult use, the four in the adult use category and the four in the medical side. Um, if a community does want them to be in their community, you have to take an affirmative vote, in this case, the town council. Um, would take an affirmative vote to allow them. And then if you allow them, you're allowed to regulate those uses. And both laws really clarified, which was uh, 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 th that we can regulate them. That was also not completely clear under at least the medical marijuana laws. Um, there was a gray area of whether we were, we meaning municipalities were preempted from regulating. And so you saw a lot of tiptoeing around in communities on the medical side about, I don't know if we can even touch those. Well, we can now. So that's very clear, it says expressly. Uh, municipalities can regulate, um, and that's through land use zoning. Mm -hmm. um, so we can zone those uses. We can um, we can have licensing requirements um, if we want to, like business licenses. Um, we can prohibit the number, or we can limit the number. Mm -hmm. um, we really have almost unfettered um, regulatory authority um, over those medical marijuana um, establishments, I'll call them, and adult use establishments. We do have one limitation, which is that we cannot... I should say two limitations. We can't prohibit the use of marijuana. 
Right. So that's legal. This is really just dealing with the commercial side, the personal use. We can't prohibit that. And we also cannot uh, prohibit caregivers from operating in this community. Caregivers are allowed to operate. Um, it, it gets to be a little bit of a gray area, and I've spoken to a number of communities about this, about, uh, but we can regulate retail caregiver stores. Right. So there's a little bit of gray area there still remaining, but, um, but we can clearly regulate in that, in that area. So that's the sort of general where we are with the state of the law. The, the state has been working out where well, the medical marijuana rules were amended um, somewhat recently. That's, those yeah. are in effect. But the, uh, what, we, what you alluded to were the adult use rules, yeah. which have been a long time coming. Mm -hmm. I understand um, they were approved by the legislature, which adjourned 630 this morning. Mm -hmm. So sometime in the middle of the night. Um, uh, we'll see what they, I mean, we could see what they were before, but they weren't approved, they were on the governor's desk. If those are approved, then um, it sets out a process for the state, for the first sort of licensing to get up the, the adult use uh, establishments up and running. So the process that people will need to get a state license, um, which on the adult use side you will need as a prerequisite for getting a, a municipal license anyway. So if a municipality wants to allow adult use, um, that operator would still need a state license first, and they'd have to come get approval from the municipality. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Don. So I had a uh, follow-up question. So you, uh, at the municipal level, Phil, you said we cannot prohibit use, uh, cannot prohibit caregivers. How about possession or age limits? Uh, are those things No, those are regulated by the state. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because I've read someplace where some states have done that, or you know, maybe the state laws are different. Yeah, so the possession is, is uh, so it's already legal to possess today and use. Um, what, what's sort of been lagging really on the adult use side is the, is the establishments part, the commercial side of it. How do you buy it, essentially? And one other thing I was just going to add is uh, to try to test to see if my thinking is straight on this, but in a couple of prior meetings, of, uh, some of the discussion has indicated that uh, there's a feeling that over time the medical... Uh, Retail will will go away. It will be superseded by adult use retail. Do I have that right? Is that? I mean, I, I think the comment you're referring to is that the recreational marketplace will likely overwhelm and overtake the medical marketplace, just because of the restrictions in the medical versus adult use. I, you know, I, I, it's not a legal thing, but I had heard that, and then some of the literature I'd also read that. Some yeah. towns yeah. had experienced that. So. I mean, I, I certainly know anecdotally. I mean, we work with a, a lot of towns, and so we've seen this in a lot of towns. That a lot of um, uh, we've heard anecdotally through the code offices and others that a lot of these uh, operators were clearly getting ready to switch over to adult use. Yeah. And, and for the purpose of people who are watching or in the audience, could you talk about? Because I, I had, as I said, about six emails, and most of them had to do with location of marijuana establishments near schools or places where children are or young people are. Um, and also, um, you know, the so-called social clubs. Right. Could you talk sure. about how that all fits in, social clubs? and Is that like a marijuana bar, so to speak? Yeah, so... Um there used to be a category in the adult use, what used to, where people used to, call it, used to call it recreational, it's now called adult use, called social clubs. But that mm -hmm. no longer exists. That's okay. not allowed. So when the legislature uh, rewrote that law, that was one of the things, one of the categories they eliminated. Okay. So that's just off the table. And I, that, you know, the idea behind that was sort of like a bar, right? Like a right. marijuana version of a bar. Because that was the Place concern go, that together. I was, that these yeah. people... Because people are very unclear, obviously. I mean, yeah. we're all sitting here, yeah. um, it's new. and it's all new for most of us, unless we're in the business. Um, so that's why we want to try to get it right the first time. That's why I'm glad people have shown up. Um, and, and, and in terms of the schools, I'm just yeah. trying to find a specific provision. I want to say there already there already is a prohibition on location. I want to say it's 500 feet. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, from a school already. Okay. Today. But I think that where there has been some confusion is that municipalities have the opportunity to include daycare centers or preschools, that the state language pertains to public and private schools, K through 12, but yeah. that municipalities need to identify if they wish to include preschools and daycare centers as sensitive uses that would follow the same standards. And for that matter, any use. 
I mean, because again, we were given really unfettered regulatory authority. So the fact that they don't have to exist at all, if you want them to exist, you could you could right. zone them any any way you want. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. But there is that already. That prohibition is already in state law um, okay. to on how close these these could be to schools. Okay. Well, that would answer a uh, few people actually who emailed. Yeah. That was those were their predominant concerns. Um, yeah. To be honest, and then I also had a couple of people email who were like, "Can't we stop marijuana totally?" I did have that. You know, people are just like, "Why are we doing this?" But yeah, you know, I mean, I think that's you hear that, and um, but it is legal in the state today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, yeah. The, but but municipalities have are able to decide if you want it sold, at least on a commercial level, in your community. That's a this community decision now. Under these I new laws. heard. I don't know if this is true or not, but I heard Old Orchard was either considering that or had. That decided not to opt in on anything. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. That's the last I had heard too. Yeah. I also represent. I also represent Old Orchard Beach. Yeah. Um, uh, but the last I heard, I haven't actually had a lot of questions there recently. But that's what I'd heard. I mean, there are other communities that have um, affirmatively opted in. Yeah. Yeah. So South Portland South is re re adopted regulations. Portland, right. I think, is in the process. Saco. Uh, Saco, Bangor, Bath. Uh, there's a number of communities that are draft either have already drafted ordinances or in the process of drafting ordinances to see how what it would look like if they were to allow them. Mm -hmm. And when we first started this conversation last year, I had reached out to all of the managers in our surrounding communities. That's when we had first been told right. that Old Orchard was leaning towards not opting in. And Gorham had not fully opened discussion, but they were leaning towards perhaps not, or at least being careful and cautious, I think, especially where they're a university town, wanting to be very um, thoughtful in how they proceeded. And you'll see some communities, because it, uh, we have options, is that some communities are opting for certain categories but not others, which you're allowed to do. Right. So it's not an all opt-in or it's right. not an all or nothing. Right. Some communities have decided, and especially reg agricultural areas, that cultivation is going to be okay. Or right. the, even the manufacturer testing, but maybe they don't want the retail sales. You can sort of slice and dice it that way as a regulatory matter in your community. Right. So, so one, one just to build on that point a bit, uh, another thing that I have seen in the reading is that uh, uh, some towns have found it very helpful to watch how this has unfolded in other in other towns right, right? so um, so what I'm wondering is you know if we're talking time frames here I'd heard that in the last meeting we were thinking this the state didn't have expectations for towns to uh, have a handle on this until possibly March of next year mm -hmm. um, and we've had some towns that have decided already my my question is you know how much of a runway I mean, what will we what will we know, or what's a reasonable time frame to, to be able to get some handle on how it's going? You know, what is that? What is that from today to to next March? What's that? Six months or something like that? Or what is it? Nine? I didn't do the math on it, but how far? Nine. Nine months? Is that nine so, months? Uh, yeah. so I don't. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I. I guess we won't know, but it, it does seem to me that that's sort of a key question. Sure. Oh, yeah. What sort of time frame do we think would be reasonable that we'd have some, you know, local experience to be able to draw from? It's a good question. I mean, as it relates to the adult use side. Yeah. yeah. So, the, the, because adult use establishments won't be able to operate until the state starts issuing their licenses. We're, like we said, we're just, the, right. the rules are just being implemented as we speak, um, assuming the governor signs that, those rules. So that's going to take some time. How long does she have to sign? Uh, it was it the 10, ten days? days. Yeah. It's still the 10 days. So she yeah. has 10 days. And then, and I'm guessing some folks in the audience will probably be able to inform us better than anybody yeah. else out there. Um, but do we know the time frame of that process of applying, of application to completion? We do. Okay. I see some nodding heads. So, <laughs> so there will be some we'll let you time, obviously. Some Share that time. with us. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, yeah. that, for me, will be a part of what it. guides my decisions. Yes. Okay. Um, and as just a, a kind of reminder of where the process has been with this committee, um, a few months ago we met to kind of work through those eight different categories and find out what, which of those categories this committee was interested in exploring further. There was not interest from this committee in exploring adult use retail right. stores. Right. So some of that experience that we'd be looking at from other communities don't apply here since we've already taken that off the table from an opt-in standpoint. So um, as far as seeing how communities are experiencing um, medical marijuana retail stores, which is something that this committee has expressed some interest in seeing language for, we might already have some data to be looking at from some communities that were 
um, kind of on top of that early on. So, and then as from the cultivation and uh, manufacture and testing front, I think that there is, is expected to be less community impact, especially on the manufacture and testing um, activity. And we, again, would have access to data about how those activities in the medical side are impacting communities. That's, that's information that we can get for you. Okay. Uh, we need a we need microphone. a mic there. <laughs> I just realized. Oh, is there one there? I'm sorry, I can't see it. All right. Uh, any questions, Council Foley? Okay. I think that was the only one at that point. So yeah, so we're talking about seven out of the eight is what we've agreed to start exploring and okay. moving. Okay. Okay. What I would like to do now is to invite folks one at a time, not rush the podium, <laughs> um, to go to the podium, tell us your name and where you live and what your interest is and any comments or questions. We'd love to hear from you. So no one wants to rush to be first. Oh, there we go. Oh, go ahead. Go right ahead. And I think, yeah, make sure, make sure that you... Yeah, and try to keep it, like, I don't have a timer per se, but three to five minutes at most. I'm not sure how those work, so. I don't know either. I don't know. We can probably hear you. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a question well, let's for the TV. Uh, for the people at home so that the people watching the meeting can hear. My name is Shelly Pelletier uh, from 10 Snow Canning Road. So, so here we go again. I won't bore you with the speech about how much I'm money and time anything. we have invested in our grow operations. You have heard it many times before. The two items I wish to discuss is the caps and the distance points. First, the caps on the number of licenses. This, I would think, would be regulated by the zoning laws in place that allow what businesses or operations are allowed and in what area of the town. If a grower were to approach me to rent a space today, my answer would have to be no, because I have no space to rent. My answer should never be, you have to check, you have to check with the town to see if they have reached their quota. And maybe as a landlord, I don't want to rent to a grower, because I don't have the electrical requirements, or I just don't have the right space. But that should be my decision. Now to the second point, distance. I would like to know of any other business this is required. Do you tell a farmer he can't farm his land because it abuts another farm? Do you tell a retail store they can't open in that space because your door is too close to another like business? I will say again, as I have said before, all I expect is a level playing field. I am not doing anything illegal. I am the owner of a legal business that wishes to continue operating like any other business. Yeah, thank you. Next. <laughs> yeah, if you could try to use the microphone, because yeah, folks hold you it can't in. hear at home, but even though you may be, we may be able to hear it. Thank you. It's on. It's on. Okay. Yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> well, Mike Shannon, uh, 10 Snow Canning Road as well. Uh, 10 and and I'm in business with my father. We have a cultivation. We've been trying to, as you guys all know, figure out a storefront. That's really about it. You know, I'm going to keep it at that. I know you'll get comments on everything else. But in terms of medical storefronts, there are plenty of towns and, you know, data that exists on that already. You know, there's a very large one in Portland. There's actually mm -hmm. multiple locations in Portland. There are a few in Biddeford, tons of them in Wyndham. Don't think in Gray. But I do know that when you start going out that way, and, you know, the illumination show, wherever that is, mm -hmm. that we went to last year, I must have driven by five or six of them along the way. So there are plenty of towns that you guys can get your data and ask the towns, you know, what their experience have been. Uh, I know people that own stores in a few of those locations. So if you need any help on who to talk to, I can probably help with that. Um, but that's all I'm going to say for right now, and I'll let everyone else get on their way out the topic. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Next. I'm Henry Keller here, 10 Snow Canning Road, Scarborough. I'm just here as a renter. All I do is rent space. I don't grow it, don't smoke it, don't sell it. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I'm just concerned with the distances that are starting to talk about 
So I got growers to the door to door. I got a grower here, grower there, grower there. I got one of them, I got six right in a row. So there's 14 growers in my building. Mm -hmm. And to put, you know, I went to a zone, and I think I'm legal. You know, nobody's ever complained about it. And it's kind of late in the game to say, well, you got to be 200 feet apart, or you can't be door to door, or you can't. Mm -hmm. Can't do this. Everything I've done, I've got all my inspections. My, as uh, Mr. Butler knows over here, you know, we've done a lot of business together. And as far as I know, everything we do is legal. But when you start coming, I can't, you know, the people here that are talking here today, they're, they're door to door. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what they mean by being, you know, they have so much room. Because the other thing that's going to come into play now, what they're talking about, is on the medical side. You know, people are going to sell, they're going to have like a place for a customer to come in. And, you know, they're going to be door to door. I mean, there's going to be out of 14 rows, there's probably going to be a half a dozen that's going to have a medical, they're going to sell medical marijuana. And it sounds like they're going to put them 200 feet apart or 100 feet apart or whatever it is. And you're stopping these people from having a livelihood when you're doing that. So unless I misunderstood what I'm talking about, how about the, the number of growers I can have or the distance between the growers, mm -hmm. I possibly I possibly can meet very many of those for the standard. And you know I took a building that was dilapidated and abandoned and today it has over hundred people working there. Sure. And I'm at hundred percent capacity. Someone moves, generally speaking, a grow, another grow will want to take its place. Mm -hmm. So right now I'm at 14, but I could very become 25, like I have mm -hmm. 25 tenants. So that's what my concern is. Okay. So if someone knows something different than that, or if I'm going the wrong way, about it the wrong way. No, this is good information. This is why uh, we want people to come out and tell us what their concerns are and, and what they think, you know, they'd like to see for the future. So, all right, thank, thank you. you very much. Yes. Next. I feel like I'm at the deli. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Denise Hamilton, <clears throat> 167 Two Rod Road. And we are in a predominantly residential area, um, other than Beechridge Motor Speedway. And new development across the street, lots of children. We have a commercial grow house right next door to us. Um, they, you know, they're legal. They're doing things right to my understanding. However, um, and the reason they can do it, even though it's a predominantly residential area, it's because we're rural farming. So mm -hmm. they fall under the agriculture. And we're, we also have a light industrial overlay. Yeah. Our problem is the smell. We can't open our windows. We can't sit out on our porch. We can't sit in our backyard because we're inundated by skunk weed. And it's very frustrating. We moved back to Maine five years ago into the home that my husband grew up in. We've done a ton of work to not only improve our house value, but those around us. And to have this move in right next door is affecting us. It's affecting our home. It's affecting what we can and cannot do. We have an in-home business. We had to jump through hoops to have an in-home business. We had to go before zoning. We had to go before code. We had to, we had to, they had to send letters out to the neighbors. And because it's agriculture, they were able to go about their business. And we don't have the traffic, you know, coming in. But when we have customers on the rare occasion come in the driveway, get out of their vehicle and say, huh. Someone's growing some weed nearby, huh? Mm. They might not want to come and do business with us if they're totally against it. And I'm not against a legal business. It's just in, I'd like to see the town regulate 
where these businesses can be when you have a predominantly residential area with children and families. And that's all I'm asking for. Not to mention snow. That I don't know what can be done about it. I don't know the business. You know, is there a filtration system that can be, you know, mandated? But when there's houses, and it's not just us complaining. We've had people, neighbors come down and say, wait, have you seen all the skunks in the area? I mean, the smell is horrendous this year. It's not the skunks. Mm -hmm. It's next door. So when you got people, you know, across the neighborhood and up the road complaining, it's a problem. And we hope the town takes that into consideration. Thank you. Thanks. Next. Six Bayview Avenue, and um, I have similar questions, um, really more questions than uh, statements. Uh, the February income meeting, I think um, Attorney Saucier, did I say your name correctly? Did, yeah. uh, talked about either a um, folding the or any ordinances into land what the land use zoning <coughs> is, or to do an overlay zone. So that was one of my questions. What the current thinking is on that, and um, whatever it is, that it be presented and made public at the same time as the first draft of the ordinances are, because you know the language in the ordinances could be affected by the zoning and vice versa. So that's one thought. And then um, just looking at the agenda for today's meeting about set setbacks for sensitive uses. Uh, I would add residential to any sensitive use, and particularly mixed use zones. The, uh, in the forecast in May, they did an article in South Portland and how a, a um, marijuana company was uh, applying to the planning board to set up a retail, I think a medical retail operation in a residential building, which I think we should try to avoid. Mm -hmm. um, so I would rule out mixed use totally and at least have some kind of distance, you know, significant distance from any residential use. Uh, with odor control, one of the things that I wanted to say, because I've, I've been to a lot of meetings, I've heard a lot of comments about odor control, and I've also heard a lot of what smells good to one person doesn't <laughs> necessarily smell good to the next person. But uh, for me, it's also about allergies. I have allergies to wood stoves. Um, had allergic reactions, honestly, to attending some of these meetings that we've had that I felt for a couple of days afterwards. And I say that in all due respect to all the people present here. Don't take, don't take it personally, please. It's just you know, a matter of fact for me. And um, I'm just going to share something anecdotally. Down in Boston, there is the Teddy Peanut Butter Factory. And because of odor control issues that they've had, they actually had to close schools, the days they were manufacturing to their roasted peanuts, and kids that had allergies to the peanuts couldn't go to school roast it those days, so that's something else to uh, consider. And then um, the last thing I wanted to add was I think at the last ordinance meeting that I didn't attend when I watched that line, we talked about doing September workshops with the public, mm -hmm. and I wanted to suggest that um, if this is not going to a referendum vote. In, in other words, that it's not just voters or permanent residents in Scarborough that would be um, deciding on, you know, what if there's not a vote as, as to what's going to happen. Then there are a lot of property owners that are here in July and August, and it might be a good idea to try to get something going a little earlier for those areas where there are seasonal residents and uh, further suggest the neighborhood meeting um, approach that you've done with zoning or the comp plan mm -hmm. might be a good idea in July and August, and that would give the most number of property owners a chance to attend and participate. Thank you. Thank you. I would remind folks also that at any time you can email us with your thoughts and, and whatever. And I and I know we you know we did put that out, so I will remind people of that too. 
Mm. Yeah, go ahead. Question, uh, one question I had from the folks on Snow Canning Road. That's that's a commercial zone, but what, what commercial zone is it? It's commercial light industrial? Uh, industrial. Okay. It has, an, it has a light industrial overlay. Yeah. It's a, okay. it's a very small section of overlay through that area. Okay. Next. I'd like to say one thing on uh, on the uh, uh, smell on Yoda. <clears throat> My building I got say uh, urgent processing. I've got a few of those. And, and I would say that somebody that doesn't know much about marijuana when they come in my building, the first thing they mention do they do still do stand uh, snow's clam chowder here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think that the urchin processes smell more than the marijuana oh, guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, the best if someone comes into my building to the main office, guaranteed they're going to say, You still do snow's clam chowder. Oh, yeah. So Thank you. <laughs> you got to be kind of open minded. Next. How's it going? Um, yeah. My name's Nick. I'm from Three Commercial Road in Scarborough, uh, the owner of Port City Relief. Um, Port City Relief. Relief, okay. Um, we've been here since 2013. We've had a medical store operating down there since 2014. Um, we have a pretty large facility general. Um, we are looking to go recreational um, and we are interested one day in being able to have an adult use store uh, possibly in Scarborough. And we are interested in um, what you guys might think about your avenues after you explore um, most of these categories, what your appetite could possibly be for that. I know a lot of these businesses are looking to go adult use. Um, mm -hmm. We're all trying to do it in a respectful way and not be you know, door to door and have 50 on Main Street. Thank you. I just want to add real yeah. quick. Um, so for Nick and for others who have spoken, if you haven't already, some of you have, um, but do send us your contact information via email or write yeah. it down afterwards because I can certainly, you know, try to use my sleuthing skills and find you. Mm -hmm. um, but if you make it easier for me, I'm more likely to be able to reach out. You got a card? There you <laughs> go. You can do that too. <laughs> um, but I'm just that's that makes it easier for us yeah, to just follow leave. up and connect. Yeah. That'd be great. great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and Nick, could you excuse me, just Nick, can you tell us like where you are? What zone you're in? Um, down on Three Commercial Road. Okay. Um, off by Rigby Road with the old dump. Yeah. Bit. yeah. So, so that would be probably the heaviest industrial grossest area, probably. Okay. Yeah. It was the yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Keep it short. You're going to no. dance. Right? <laughs> a little song and dance and number after. Um, all right. Well, good afternoon. My name is John Burke, uh, 16 Forecaster Way. Uh, I want to thank uh, the committee.
Committee Day for setting up this meeting, and I also want to thank Mr. Saucier for being here today as well. Um, I'm here today to, though, to urge the committee to reconsider its position on prohibiting adult use retail stores at this particular stage of the process. As the committee is aware, uh, I am concerned about the illicit cannabis marketplace in Maine and the adverse impact it will have on a regulated adult use cannabis marketplace in the state. While the state is carrying the burden of vetting adult use licensees, municipalities will play a role in the enforcement of the adult use cannabis program statutory regulation and rules. A significant concern among cannabis businesses and those of us that represent cannabis businesses is the lack of municipalities opting into the adult use program, including adult use retail stores. Earlier today, the Portland Press Herald actually printed out a statistic. If it's true, only 15 of Maine's 455 cities and towns have developed some kind of recreational adult use ordinances, and many of those that I've read have excluded adult use retail stores. While I recognize that some members of the community are against cannabis, we must be mindful that it is legal in Maine. Regardless of whether or not the committee today or in the future decides to not allow retail stores. The problem is, is that there's not enough legal means to access cannabis. Consumers will continue to flock to the illicit marketplace, which is unregulated and untaxed. Not allowing these businesses, in my opinion, creates a significant public health and safety concerns, which is what I know that we're all trying to avoid. As I mentioned previously in the other meetings, an outright ban on cannabis businesses have an unintentional effect of allowing the local illicit marketplace to grow. This is demonstrated in every state that has legalized cannabis, including Canada. On May 20th, I provided, I provided a copy of a special report that addressed three myths associated with retail stores. They addressed these are the three. Public safety, teen use, and property value concerns. After reviewing the 42 studies, the researchers who wrote the report found that one, primary cannabis stores generally stayed flat or decreased. Two, teen use of cannabis in states that have legalized cannabis has fallen since legalization. And three, property values near cannabis stores generally were never affected or in some cases they actually rose. In addition to the myths that were debunked in the report, the argument that access to cannabis will make the roads less safe has also been called into question by experts tasked by Congress. A recent federal report released earlier this month called into question how or whether THP, oh, excuse me, THC impairs driving, though most advocates and opponents alike urge against driving after consuming. The same has been said for alcohol <coughs> prescription drugs. <coughs> it should also be mentioned that Scarborough has at least one law enforcement officer certified to be a drug recognition expert who is trained to spot impairment by someone under the influence of drugs, including cannabis. I suggest the committee have its attorney develop a cannabis ordinance that includes all medical and adult use activities, including adult use cannabis retail stores. This is a, not an endorsement by the town at this stage. Allow our city attorney to prepare a fair, reasonable ordinance that includes all the activities. When the committee meets again in September, we can begin discussing the proposed language. Then the committee can make a final decision on the ordinance before sending it to the town council, if that's the process so chooses. I suggest the committee set a deadline of August 15, 2019 for its attorney to complete a proposed ordinance. The ordinance could, should be made immediately available for the public review so that we all have ample time to review it. Finally, I suggest the committee consider establishing an advisory committee for cannabis. The committee would be tasked with studying and developing recommendations to the town on cannabis-related matters. This would be a great point for cannabis businesses and also community members to be able to share thoughts and concerns and then ultimately share it with the council or <coughs> this committee. Mr. Burke, are you, are you familiar with any other towns that have advisory committees? I am not. Okay. Well, Wyndham has an okay. implementation committee. But okay. I don't know that they yet have an Okay. Yet. I was just curious. Yeah, Sorry no, to interrupt you. Yeah, no, that's a great <laughs> question. Um, so I, I want to again appreciate you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, I, I do want to add one more thing if, if I don't mind. Um, here are the rules right here. These are the rules just for adults. These are some of the most complicated, uh, what's going to be one of the most regulated marketplaces in the state of Maine. Uh, there is a there's, there's requirements in 
the rules, particularly with odor mitigation, I think is important. So in order to get an adult use license, whether it's for a cultivation facility, manufacturing facility, uh, and I believe retail stores as well, they must submit plans for ventilation and filtration systems that prevent plant odors from significantly altering the environment, environmental outer, odor outside, excuse me, while addressing uh, potential for mold. Certainly the town can enlarge that and make right. what, it, what it needs to make, but um, there are plenty of odor control measures indoor facilities currently take and uh, can take. One of them is carbon filtration, <coughs> which is quite popular in uh, Colorado. Uh, but there's other like fogging methods, uh, other technical sciencey things that I can't necessarily explain to you right now. Uh, but uh, there are certainly a requirement from an adult use perspective that they have to have these plants in place. And in addition to that, um, municipalities can also have the authority, as its attorney, as Scarborough's attorney uh, indicated, that they can also review those plants too to ensure. So it's almost like a double check if the community, if the community decides to have that as provision. <coughs> so I'm certainly just on a side note, I'm happy to answer any questions. I, I think this is very complicated. I'm not sure that anyone's going to be able to understand this all day. I spent months <laughs> trying to read this and understand this, and you know. I'm a lawyer, so uh, just for that matter, but thank you very much. Thank you. Next, anybody? Good evening. <clears throat> my name is Bill Lewandowski. Uh, I'm here with my father, Bill Sr. <laughs> Together we own a large commercial building on Pleasant Hill Road. Pleasant Hill Road is a true industrial park, and we currently have a business that we're all talking about tonight and have it in that building. Um, and I'm all in favor of the town moving ahead in a proficient, thoughtful manner. Hopefully they won't drag their feet too long. Um, but I remember the individual, Harvey, who used to call on me, he was head at one point of the Scarborough Economic Development mm -hmm. Corporation. And Harvey would call me, this is a while ago, 10 years, and say, Bill, anything I can do for you? What are you thinking? Harvey, I'm good. He says, okay, we just want to help businesses in the town of Scarborough develop to their fullest potential. <coughs> also, he would call on businesses or attract businesses outside and bring them into the town to promote business within the town. So here we are with a, a new product, if you will, a new business, and I'm hoping, as well as others here, that the town will adopt and welcome this new business and promote the product in all its aspects. Cultivation, extraction, all that will go, or all that that goes with a business such as that. Obviously, there's guidelines. We feel uh, we're in the proper location, a true industrial park. And here again, in a new generation, a new era, we want to work or continue working with the town of Scarborough on this new venture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll go ahead and go since Bill's the landlord. <laughs> <laughs> Good timing. <laughs> I'm excited to be here. We've been if you in, could hold the, uh, I'm sorry to make you do you. that. We've been in our space at <laughs> you are? Oh, sorry, I'm oh. Jill Polster. I am general counsel for the company that owns Mainly Medical. That's operating at 137 Pleasant Hill Road. I'm managing partner of Cohen Law Maine, which is a group of oh. cannabis lawyers. So I'm here with Tito Sand, and I don't know if he's going to speak, but he's our CEO and uh, one of the caregivers operating in our storefront. We've been at 137 Pleasant Hill for two years. Prior to us taking a lease, the Lewandowski's struggled to keep tenants in their buildings. It's two adjacent buildings. They would go from either being empty or renting to seasonal storage businesses, such as lobster mm -hmm. traps and things like that. So if you're talking about whether or not for the, for the last several years, they've been able to have sort of the highest, best use of their land, the answer is no. Prior, they thrived for 45 years in that location, cutting granite and building countertops mm -hmm. and making cabinetry for their custom kitchen business, which is still run out of the office space on the other side of our building. It's been a huge opportunity for them. Bill Sr. is 94 years old. 
were part of his retirement plan, just to sort of humanize this for you. We are definitely Bill Jr.'s retirement plan. Um, and so they uh, have a personal and business interest in seeing us succeed. I think even they have been surprised um, at how difficult it's been over the last couple of years and how long the road has been. We have significant capital investments at 137 Pleasant Hill. We got a building permit in 2018, right before the moratorium was enacted, maybe days before. Um, perhaps our application may have triggered some attention on that issue because I read the memo that the town attorney prepared in conjunction with that moratorium and it did reference not wanting to have an influx of caregiver storefronts, mainly related to people who weren't already cultivating in Scarborough, having this outside influx of people just grabbing um, precious storefront space when they weren't already operating here. So I don't think you've seen that influx. Um, there are a few of us here, Port City, us, another gentleman that spoke, that have been operating as a patient lounge. And why that is problematic is we are operating and stuck in a gray area of the law. The state has changed the law, and as your attorney told you, you actually have more control over caregiver storefronts by opting in than you do by continuing to make us operate as a patient lounge. The state has removed all caps. We can serve anybody who comes in with a card. We can serve out-of-state patients now as of maybe a week ago. All they have to do is show a card. The business has been opened wide up, and the distinction between caregiver storefront and patient lounge is so fine that it's almost indiscernible. It basically comes down to um, operating by appointment only, which is just unwieldy and not realistic. Even at a doctor's office, they can take patients who walk in. And we are supposed to be running like a medical office. And to have to turn away people because they didn't have a prior appointment is just silly at this point. So we're, one of the things I wanted to ask, because it's, I think, less complicated than everything else in front of the town, is you find a quicker pathway to opt into caregiver storefronts. Consider it separately. It will give you more control. It will certainly make it easier. I mean, I'm a compliance lawyer, and this has been a nightmare. And I have to say no to things like the way we word things on Instagram. Our signage was very specifically tailored um, to be very low key. Our corporate culture is to err on the side of being very conservative. And that's what you'll see in, in my core city. I've already extended an invitation. You're welcome to come over. Um, and I'd love for you to. So that's what's going on now. As far as the future, we have concern about talks about caps and lotteries. If that becomes something um, that the committee's interested in, we would ask that existing businesses be grandfathered. Or at the very least, you map out where we all are before you make decisions about distance between these businesses. You could inadvertently make a decision that puts a long time growing out of business. So hopefully you can just put us all on a map and take that into consideration. I know there was some talk about timeline to clarify. Based on everything we know, I think licensing applications will be available in November. The licensing process will go on probably 90 days before the first license comes out. So. The way it's set up, even if Scarborough is not ready, potentially some of our businesses could get a conditional license and, op and operate, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Burke, and can operate until you sort things, or at least continue to operate as we are today, um, mm -hmm. or hold on to that license until you guys sort. But it would have to be sorted within a year before our conditional license is expired. Um, I looked at the list that was provided in conjunction with the agenda. I know cost is a big concern for every town. Like Mr. Burke alluded to, the state is going to do the heavy lifting on vetting all of us on odor mitigation. By the way, we've never had one odor complaint in two years, like Port City, no noise complaints. We've had two false alarms with the fire department. Um, <laughs> but other than that, no issues, no, no complaints about odor. So the state's already put this framework out there. And in order to not have these exorbitant costs, you, I would urge you to look at not duplicating their effort in vetting these businesses. There's very strict vetting in place for licensing. And as you know, because it was talked about at prior meetings, you can set fees that are in line with what it costs to administer these businesses. Um, also on the list, design standards. Like everyone has said, just treat us like everybody else. The same design standards that would apply to a liquor store, bookstore, we're just no different other than security um, and things like that. So again, just 
mostly wanted to ask for a faster pathway to caregiver storefronts to get us out of that difficult gray area and then echo everybody else that you please find a way to allow all uses, including adult use retail. Thanks. Thank you. Question? Yeah, Phil, can you tell us what uh, the moratorium, what did that, the moratorium place uh, restriction on what activity, 2018? Yeah, so a couple of things I've heard tonight that I thought might be helpful just to give you some context. Um, so on, in terms of the moratorium, uh, what the medical marijuana law did, um, as it did, and I, I remember, I forgot that I wrote a little memo, uh, but what it did, it created this little um, uh, a, a gray period, we call it gray. So it, was, it, it turned these entities into opt-in only at the municipal level, but it was not enacted as an emergency bill. So it didn't go into effect until 180 days after the legislative session, 90 days, I'm sorry, after the legislative session. So there was this period where they were still allowed, but the old law was really gray on what was allowed. There were medical marijuana caregiver retail shops that were popping up in communities, and a lot of communities took the position. Um, there was a difference of opinion in, in uh, municipal lawyers, but some municipal lawyers took the position that, we, that you couldn't regulate those at all under that, that law. So the, they, were, they were showing up. Um, or to the extent you could regulate them, they were just retail and a number of communities that if you didn't have anything on your books and you've allowed retail then there was nothing that would say that's any different from retail so a lot of communities made a main municipal association and our firm and other municipal law firms just alerted uh, communities to the fact that if you want to regulate these uses there is this period of time where you may want to put a moratorium at least so you could take a pause and then think about whether you want to regulate them or not um, so that's that's what that reference was to so Scarborough did do that there were entities, as you're hearing tonight, that were operating. Um, and what the new law did is actually grandfather certain <coughs> uses. So if, if, if any of those entities were operating with municipal approval prior to the implementation, prior to December 13th, 2018, then they are grandfathered under the law. They can continue to uh, operate. So um, that's where you've heard some of that. Um, May I add to that for just a moment? Yeah. Part of what also prompted the the July moratorium that the council in July of 18 passed was that on July 9th, there was emergency legislation passed at the state level. If you remember, last year was a crazy legislative session that went until September. Yeah. But um, in July, there was emergency legislation passed that went into effect immediately that for the first time allowed municipalities to regulate the medical marijuana industry. And so that was, even though the, um, the language that provided for municipalities to opt in didn't go into effect until December 13 of 2018. That emergency legislation is what prompted us to even be allowed to put in the medical marijuana retail storefront moratorium. And since we had been kind of following this for the last six months, and we knew th part of what uh, prompted the state to act was that we were hearing from some of our fellow um, municipal folks in places like Lewiston and other areas that there was a proliferation of storefronts and it was causing to those communities they felt it was causing some challenges yep. um, and because the state had made clear that they were going to be kind of moving forward and, and um, it looked like there was going to be legislation passed that was going to make things opt in but with a grandfathering clause there was some thought that there would be a, a push last summer to get in place and legally operating prior to December prior to the enactment of that opt-in place. And so the moratorium was passed by council because they had the legal right to do so. That was the timing. It was just an unfortunate coincidence um, for, the, for the building permit. But the, sort of took it personally. <laughs> the, um, the, the timing of the moratorium in Scarborough was really about the July 9th enactment of emergency legislation by the state that finally gave us permission to do so. And that was, very, that was pretty universal throughout communities at least we represent that um, we were being asked those questions. And so I, I th you, you saw a lot of moratoria being up. Uh, during that time period, stop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Everybody wanted to see what everybody else is doing. Well, it, it, it was the it was the combination, as, uh, as Larissa said, of the grandfathering and the ability to regulate and opt in, right? So if you you were you, they would have been grandfathered. So even if you wanted to allow them, you were going to opt in, but you were going to have certain regulations around that. You may want a licensing. You were going to lose that ability during that month that summer period. So uh, people recognize that that was an occurrence at the statewide level, and so that's that's why you saw a lot of moratoria being adopted during that time period. The incentive to open a shop quickly was there, mm -hmm. and so towns yeah. had incentive to block. Yeah. So I have one follow-up question. So going forward, so what 
happens if we were to develop ordinances that, or if we decided not to opt in on something that's been grandfathered, what happens? They can continue to operate. <coughs> so they're going to be very happy business people. If, if, they're, if, they, if they truly are grandfathered, and yeah. there's some questions yeah. about some of yeah. them. Uh, what All the law said, it wasn't all that helpful, quite frankly. It yeah. said those businesses that are operating with municipal approval, as of December 13th, there's some discussion at the state. What does that mean? Just as a point of clarity, yeah. as, a, as a business owner, there's not a lot well, of... Well, come on up here, please. Because I want to get back to... Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> My name is Chito Sands. I'm the uh, CEO of Manly Medical. We're located at 137 Pleasant Hill. Um, just as a specific point to that, and sort of speaking to some of the other points around how we want to operate as a business, no one prefers <coughs> to operate in a grandfathered state, we're in a gray area. Um, there's no desire for any of these businesses to take advantage of that because it gives us some benefit. It allows us to operate and continue business, but all of us would prefer that the state opt in and regulate us, or the, the, the town opt in and regulate us. Um, so as a point of clarity, there's not a benefit mm -hmm. for us to operate in that space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just Thanks. following up on, on that, because it's a very good point, is that uh, sort of gets that issue, is that just like any other use in your zoning ordinance that's grandfathered or the legal term is legally nonconforming, they're sort of static in a moment of time. Yeah. And there's limits on expanding that, changing it. You know, you, there's, there's risks of losing your grandfathered status mm. if you do anything different from what you were doing. Yeah. So it, there, it, there's a risk for businesses that are operating that area for sure. Okay. It's not, yeah. That's helpful. But I think that, that it, what should be really made, make sure that everyone very clearly understands the growers that we have in our community currently are legally growing, legally active okay. in their businesses. They were all established and had um, permission to, be, to grow marijuana in the town of Scarborough prior to December 13. There have not been, to my knowledge, there have not been any new growers that have come in since then, and there has not been expansion of business since then. I'm sorry to talk about another point. I just want to talk about growing for a second because... There is a difference between cultivation of medical marijuana and adult yeah. use marijuana. Yes. If you noticed uh, when I was going through the categories, there is no category of medical marijuana cultivation. Uh, that, that's not a category that exists. Right. And that's because caregivers are allowed to cultivate. Right. Mm. Just as a, as a, by being a caregiver, that's one of the things they can do. Right? They can, they can it's like it's 50 plants, uh, or 30, 30 and, six, and 60 uh, uh, immature and unlimited seedlings. They're allowed to do that. Right. And remember, we can't prohibit caregivers or limit the number of caregivers. So right. we can potentially regulate. I mean, that's a gray area in terms of maybe some performance standards, but we can't prohibit that. Yep. On the adult use, that's different. That was set aside as a separate category, a separate established type of establishment is the word we use. And that's going to be regulated at the state level and also at the local level. So I just want to, because a couple of commenters made a point about what's going on today, oh. is I assume medical marijuana growing. Maybe they're, you know, um, so... That's not really what we're talking about in terms of regulation, other than maybe some regulation around the edges, but not prohibiting or zoning. Mm -hmm. um, and this is just, and we're going to get back to public comment, but this popped up in my head. So if I want to grow marijuana for my own use, I can do so, and is there a limit? Yeah, so patients can grow and caregivers can grow, and dispensaries have certain... But as an adult that. who just wants to just have my own marijuana? Have yeah. Three mature, plants. Three mature yeah. plants, okay. Yeah. I was just curious. Per about adult that. in the home. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that, that was just the only other point. I, wanted, I thought that was good. Yeah. Clarify that. Okay. Um, next. Uh, can I ask a question on that? Just because I'm not clear on what a personal caregiver is. So if a personal caregiver can grow, I think you just said 30 plants, yeah. versus yeah. personal can grow three. And I guess the question becomes, how is one designated a personal caregiver to make the distinction? Well, Were you yeah, good enough to answer that? Yeah. Oh, I can answer it. Yeah, I was going to say, you can yeah. answer it. Yeah. Uh, my name is Tom Felby. Uh, I live at 140 Bourbon Road in Scarborough. I have a cultivation facility at 148 Pleasant Hill Road in Scarborough. Um, and I became a caregiver in 2010. You're a caregiver, you're permitted to flower six plants 
per patient that you are taking care of. You're allowed five cards, so in effect five patients, so you're allowed to flower 30 plants, which is what's permitted. Mm -hmm. um, and in 2009, I was living in Old Orchard Beach in Ocean Park, three blocks from the, from the beach. Um, and at the time, and it's still true, law enforcement could get a list of everybody who was registered as a caregiver. Yeah. And we had a cop car sitting on our, tr on our street every night. Um, and then in 2010, uh, my, my landlord at the time was a, was a lobsterman, and he had some salty, uh, had some, had some salty friends. <laughs> and one of his buddies was over one night, and, and this individual has a son who has epilepsy. And his son was um, passing through the town of Scarborough at 2 in the morning, and it got pulled over by Scarborough police. And they had found marijuana in his car, and he said he was a patient, and he, but he didn't have his card with him. So mm -hmm. they took the marijuana, and they took the paraphernalia. Mm -hmm. Well, then... His father, the next day, went in and talked to Chief Moulton and said, I'm here to pick up my son's marijuana. Um, here's his patient card, and I'd like it back. And the chief said, yep, you're right, that's the law, and gave it back to him. So that year, I moved to Scarborough for, for um, cultivating my marijuana because I thought it was much more tolerant, at, at, specifically from the law enforcement side of things, it was much more tolerant as well as understanding of what the law was, and it wasn't going beyond what the law was. Um, and I, I think, in my mind, I always looked at Scarborough as being marijuana friendly, um, and, and I agree with this attorney here that you should reconsider uh, retail stores um, for adult use. I, I don't see how they're any different than liquor stores. Um, I think now the uh, city mayor of South Portland, Claude Morgan, um, ha has made a, a lot of great points on why is this being treated any different than alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think South Portland's rules reflect that. Um, so in that regard, I, th I think you should reconsider retail stores. Um, I, as far as uh, smell, ordinance is concerned. I, th I think I said this at two, two months ago meetings. Um, I, it's a very difficult thing to, it's a very difficult thing to measure, you know, and there's something called like a, a, a nose radar or something where you like breathe it in and it like rates what it is, but you know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that someone could be more sensitive or less sensitive to what odor is. And I, and I think that's an extremely difficult thing to, to regulate and it's going to be even all the more so difficult specific to caregivers when you're getting into the medical side of things I mean at least from my limited legal perspective if I had the funds and I were a caregiver or if I were a patient and I were growing and the town came and shut me down I would file a lawsuit the next day mm -hmm. because you are taking away my medicine rights um, so I, th I think something along the lines of carbon filter requirement would be fine, but um, beyond that, specifically in the, in the medical side of things, um, I, I, I think that's going to be difficult mm -hmm. to, to, to regulate. Um, and then with cultivation of rec, I, I think that Anything that's zoned rural farming should be included in cultivation of rec because it is farming, whether it's THC-containing cannabis or whether it's hemp cannabis. Um, otherwise, what's the point of living somewhere that's zoned rural farming uh, if, if that's not an option? You know, then you're, uh, you're looking at rezoning the entire town um, if you're going to exclude that. Anybody who hasn't spoken yet would like to get up and add their two cents worth? Yes, I, I would. Yeah. 
How are you? Good. My name's Michael Sawyer, and I'm a parent forecast. Uh, a lot of you guys might know me because the woman behind me didn't want me to go my marijuana. Right. Um, I think it's my right to grow, and I do live in a farming, like you said, area where I can have pigs and goats and you know, what's going to smell worse to my neighbors? A little bit of marijuana, or I put, I put pigs right behind the house. You know, I don't understand the smell concept because I don't like a lot of flower smells. Mm -hmm. So, am I going to make everybody take their flowers out of their gardens? A little bit of weed growing in my backyard yeah, doesn't hurt anybody. Um, I don't know how you guys are going to regulate the driving part of it either because. Mm. That's another sticky work you're going to go down. Because I've been smoking all my life. I've been driving all my life smoking. And I haven't gotten in hardly any accidents. And it wasn't because of weed that I got into accidents. So I don't know if the town has anything to do with the driving part of it, mm -hmm. or if that's just the state part. But that's a, I mean, people have been smoking all their lives driving. And they haven't gotten into highly any accidents. So, how are you going to do anything about it? And that's a law enforcement thing. Driving yeah. while impaired is a law, so. Yeah. They don't specify the impairment, I don't think. I'm looking yeah, at they, police officer friends back here. Could be pills. Yeah, oh yeah. Oh. Any type of can Thank be. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, thank you. Can I just <laughs> shout something? Yeah. Obviously, we're the minority of people here, <laughs> and, and that's fine. Um, with the smell, it does come down to the good neighbor ordinance. We have been in touch with the town about it. This is a commercial grow house that has been started in a converted garage, not in an industrial area like the majority of you people are talking about, and I understand that. Um, this is a residential area. Yes, we're rural farming. There are laws or ordinances placed on what can and cannot happen in rural farming. We only have an acre of land. I'd love to have a horse. Guess what? I can't. I need two acres. Mm -hmm. I can have a farm animal under 100 pounds. Well, put ordinances in the rural farming of what is allowed and not allowed. But the smell is part of the Good Neighbor Ordinance. Mm -hmm. And you know we have been in discussion with the town on that. And so just maybe because it doesn't affect some people, it does affect others. And you have to respect that, just as I respect what all of you are doing for your business. And it does affect us because we can't enjoy our home. And that's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. Come on. Uh, so uh, they changed the law so that uh, in 90 days, 75% of what we sell can be sold wholesale, and 25% of it needs to be sold retail. Sold retail. Um, none of us have the right to have adult use stores and very few towns are opting in. None of us are going to be able to even be able to meet these requirements um, for the new law in 90 days. Um, so that's something I'd like you guys to keep in mind is that every single person that grows is mandated to retail 25% of their product. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. Oh, that's why I'm looking at Phil. Because there's a difference between that. Yeah, that's why I, we were just looking at our attorney, <laughs> like too. 25% so of our sales need to be retail. And like one person spoke earlier, she was alluding more to almost the you know, buy appointment or the you can't have a storefront. And I know a lot of people here have also talked about the illicit marketplace. You know, you mm -hmm. guys, and I know you guys are doing things and we're moving forward and everything is, you know, going that direction. But... The way that sometimes the caregivers feel is like you're, you know, we're almost doing things wrong because we can't just put an advertisement out there with some sort of scrutiny. Um, you know, I don't have any familiarity with the 
you know, the question of odor facility being spoken about. I know we're in industrial, so I'm sure that has some sort of difference. Um, as I told John, who, you know, we've spoken on a few legal terms, is I actually am doing a few more updates to my facility, and we are putting carbon filters in. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know how it will help necessarily with allergies, but I would say, and again, I don't know who the people are near you, but maybe there's something that people could work together on where maybe there's an acceptable level because I do know that where we are in our facility, a lot of the smell around based on the wind. It's that simple. The direction of the wind oh, yeah. makes a huge difference for where the smell is. So if you do have a filtration system, you know, like someone else alluded to, we all, you know, we all receive things different. Colors, smells, any information. My allergies have been an absolute nightmare in the last two weeks. I wake up, I feel like I have the flu almost every day. So I do, you know, have that sensitivity. If I was a neighbor of one of those residents, I would want to work with them because, again, you bring up. I didn't know there was a good community or good neighbor. Good neighbor. You call it, but I do think that is important, and I think that's one of the things that you guys have made clear in these years worth of meetings that I've been coming to. Is that you want to do it right, you want it to get as close to making as many people as happy as possible. I know Larissa and I had a conversation. You're not going to make everyone happy, right. maybe not fully, but at least try to get somewhere there in between. And with the you know the conversations going on in here today, I think you guys are really you know making a lot of progress on that. And I definitely think this has been helpful. So, like yeah. I said, I'd be happy to help any, whether it's a resident, whether it's the town members, other growers, attorneys, whatever. My door is always open as well. So I'm going to drop my card with you. Anyone who wants it, yep. get their you know, contact. And Great. Keep working together. Thank you. you want Quickly, to yes. <laughs> I, won't, I, I know I'm a little long-winded, but I, I will be brief. What is um, it? You guys get paid by the Lord? Yeah, I haven't been by the Lord. Lord. No. Just for the record, <laughs> I'm doing this on my own time. I don't represent anyone. Oh, OK. So, uh, <laughs> so just a couple things. I think it's really important um, that if for anyone who has questions about the rules, take a look at them. Most of the rules that were put out uh, provisionally on June in June um, are what are have been will likely be signed by the governor. Um, there was some minor changes to them, but for just for a couple things of what an adult use program has to go through, they have to go through a comprehensive background check. Yeah. They got to go through not only the state background check but an FBI background check. Yeah. That requires them to hand over their fingerprints. And so someone like me who dabbles in privacy sometimes, uh, understands that once you give the government your fingerprint, they have it forever. Huh. And so that's something, you know, that they have to disclose and have to provide that most business owners do not have to do that. Another thing that they have to be able to do is all their employees have to go through background checks, and they have to be approved. There's also good character conduct clauses. So if you have a disqualifying drug offense, whether it's a, a specific drug offense or one <coughs> offense that involves crime of dishonesty, fraud. Any of these individuals, so like a business entity, and there's like five members of an LLC, all of them have to go through this process. This is far greater than any other business uh, licensing that I'm aware of. Perhaps Mr. Saucer knows differently, but I don't believe there's anyone else in the state that has that. Uh, so those are just a small sample of what the applicants have to go through. In addition to that, they have to provide an operating plan, which pretty much details everything they a security plan, which pretty much details every security measure they have to take. A facility plan, which has to show exactly where everything is in the facility. Anyone applying for an adult use license is an open book. And it's a pretty scary thing. But the cannabis businesses that want to try to do it are doing it as good actors. They're doing it because they think or they believe that based upon the marketplace, it's needed. And it really is. The illicit marketplace in Maine is actually unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And if you, if, you haven't, if you haven't seen it, I'd love to have had some law enforcement com, uh, members come in because they would probably say the same thing. Um, so I would just leave it as, if you have any questions whatsoever, certainly happy to answer them. Or if you don't want to talk with me, um, all this stuff's online. Take a look at it, read it. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think that once you take a look at the requirements, what happened in 2016, is not what we're seeing now in 2019. This is completely different. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you guys taking the time to see this. Thank you. Anyone? Hopefully. A piece of legislation, I just said it was actually emergency legislation. Okay. Like yeah. Immediately, uh, the piece that takes place in 90 days is the plant count can now be 500 square feet or 30 plants. Okay. 
Who's to saw his hair on shrooms? Pull that. We're going to pull, just so you know, part of why I'm doing what we, I should say, are doing what we're doing today is, is to hear from a number of the different voices out there. Everyone has different levels of expertise and or experience, um, good, bad, or otherwise, uh, with the industry. Um, we want to try to get it right the first time. Um, so, you know, I thank all of you for coming and giving us your input. Please continue to email if you think of anything. Um, Mr. Saucier will be working over the summer. We are going to talk about, you know, dates to ha have this back by. Um, as you know, it's a process. The Ordinance Committee doesn't make the decision for the council. What we do is we come up with concepts, if you will, drafts, ideas um, that we then present to the council for action. So it, it's, again, it's a process and it does take a bit of time. But I did want to try to get ahead of it as much as we could. But again, being somewhat burdened by the state themselves. I mean, you know, you, you, you guys live it every day, those of you who are in the business, uh, as to, you know, it's kind of like, Start, stop, start, stop, start, stop, uh, and then something else comes up. And we're dealing culturally. I, I mean, I'm, I'm an old lady. I'm almost, I'm 64. Uh, I grew up with, uh, what was it, Meryl, what was it? Reefer Madness. We were shown that movie in the seventh grade, you know, don't ever, you know. So you've got this whole cultural thing. It wasn't a new thing. release then, though, I don't think. No, it wasn't. It was an old movie. Dawn's about the same age as I am. But, I mean, you know, so. I clearly never saw it. <laughs> so patient, you know, you're going to be patient. We're dealing with a cultural thing in a very old state, too. So, but we're, we're going to get there. Um, so if there's no further, yes, would you like to talk? Are you going to cover other instances of the ordinance tonight, or is it just... Do you want to come up and ask, uh, just tell us who you are? about and... sound abatement. Okay. Oh, oh, that's, no, not, not... We can't do that tonight? Well, not right at the moment. We're dealing well, with marijuana right now. Question. Okay, <laughs> you can have a seat, yeah. <laughs> We're still on marijuana right now. Okay. Okay? You said, you said just marijuana tonight, and I didn't... Yes. Know. Yeah, basically, that's that's what we're doing tonight is marijuana. Okay. Are, okay. Are we gonna? We will talk. About, let me get through okay. this and then right. hang tight. <laughs> so, uh, Larissa, uh, do you now that we've I think heard from the public, the people that wish to speak at least once. At least for now. Yeah. Um, do you wish to now kind of start to give Phil some further guidance from you as counselors about what you want to see him include or not include in that um, draft? Because I think that yeah. in order for him to come back to you yeah. with a draft, he's going to need to have direction um, from you mm -hmm. about what you do or do not wish to see in that draft. Mm -hmm. um, so again, as kind of a recap of a few months ago, provided you with um, an example of South Portland's ordinance to kind of see what they have chosen to go forward with. That is what prompted us to meet with um, Assistant City Manager Josh Rennie to learn about their process. Um, and that was, one of the outcomes from that conversation was inviting Phil right. to really be the one that drafts this ordinance. Um, and the kind of questions that Josh had mentioned in that meeting needed to be decided on by the elected officials mm -hmm. in order for the attorney to be directed are kind of outlined in the in the agenda packet item that I included for you as item five. Um, mm -hmm. So if there's if there's interest in, in doing that this evening, I think that would allow Phil to, yeah. to get started on that process. If there's not, um, if I think we we'll need to perhaps think about when that conversation should take place before Phil starts to draft, because I think that at this point, um, there isn't enough information for him to, to go on to I draft. Feel I can give him info. What are you feeling like, though? And Kay? Well, I, I've heard a couple things tonight that I think should be factored into the development of any ordinances. One was, it's pretty clear from the folks that are grandfathered now that they, you know, they want consideration for the, the fact that they are existing businesses and have pressures in terms of, uh, uh, you know, 
and desires to continue to operate, in, <coughs> particularly in uh, commercial areas. So I think, you know, we would want to pay attention to the grandfathering. We want to pay attention to the uh, to the the zoning aspects, mm -hmm. not just commercial, but also I've heard, heard people complaining, you know, and, and legitimate issues with with odor uh, mm -hmm. and also traffic, kind of ground traffic, and maybe poor choice of words, but uh, in in um, areas that may be in uh, rural areas but are residential uh, and mm -hmm. also residential areas. And so, so I think how you fold that in, I don't know, but those are issues that if we don't start to factor them into what we're developing, right. then we're gonna we're gonna have to go back and do it. So, right. So those those are two things I heard fairly yeah. clearly this evening. That, uh, uh, that I think should be reflected. In it, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. Now, the only thing I should say, um, you know, someone's kind of suggesting, well, why don't you kind of take a look at adult use and pull everything forward on that? I don't know on that. Uh, I'm not, at this point, I'm not opposed to looking at it later. I don't feel as though I have to see everything all at once, but that's, that's my hmm. uh, view today based upon what I've heard this evening. Mm -hmm. so. and, and I would just tag on to what Dawn said about um, lot size, because I live in an RF zone, um, and it's pretty much minimum two acre lot, but you can yeah, end it's on the, so, you know, can we do something so that it's bigger, maybe lot size when you get out, get into those zones? And uh, concept of overlays, in areas or certain areas and so we have, I don't know we yeah. have talked about that um, a few times that given the number of zones in town and and where with um, <coughs> things like RF um, having some dense residential areas right. that it may be best to craft a, a couple of different commercial marijuana overlay districts yeah. one being specifically for the cultivation and the other maybe being for the um, manufacture testing and retail yeah. stores so that there is really clear definition about where that activity should um, take place. Certainly with respect to our current growers, um, there has been some challenge in us knowing actually which, where growers have existed. And I'm sure part of that secrecy comes from an unfortunate experiences like we heard um, with uh, the, the old Orchard Beach experience that there's perhaps some real legitimate caution about wanting to be um, upfront with the municipality about what is growing and where. Um, but I think that for those growers that we know exist, it will not be a heavy lift at all to create a map um, in, that we will hold internally um, that will show where all of those growers are and that that can be used to help inform where that overlay district is, that we're not creating non-conforming lots right. by, with that kind of grandfather statue because that's a mess that we don't want to deal with. Right. right. Can I ask? Well, I have a comment, a comment and a clarifying question. So my comment is simply this, and as I listened this evening and as I have had continued to have these conversations with, you know, people that I know and, and um, particularly young people <laughs> in my life I've been reaching out to because I'm just very interested and curious, um, this is a, an evolving conversation. I mean, people's attitudes have uh, changed even since the election. Um, and so, you know, where, where I might have been three or four months ago is even continued to evolve as to where I am today. Um, and so my, my preference is that we don't go too long without continuing this conversation and getting the work moving. And that was part of my clarifying question is really, so I know at this point, and there are some other issues, and I think as we heard tonight, the Good Neighbor Ordinance is overlaying and playing into this issue a little bit and I think it has issues of its own <laughs> um, that we need to kind of talk about so I, I'd love to a talk about can we still have like let's we talked about getting rid of July and August meetings I, I'm fine with July but I think we should bring back an August meeting potentially potentially um, and then um, and then I want clarity for what is it that you need from us so that you can do your job yeah. So uh, what I need to know is what you want to do. Quite <laughs> so, I want so, you to write yeah. it all and up and let us react. So I can write anything. I can write anything. Um, but what, what you need to know is, do you want to opt in? We right. want to opt in. Yes, we want to opt in. Should we, should yeah. we take a formal vote on that just so that, because we've already discussed it. And you've already formally voted. If it, if we, we did. We, we did. have. So do we, we need you to? You opted into everything but adult use. But right. adult use at this point. Adult use. Okay. At this point. They opted into adult use. Um, 
manufacture, adult use testing, and adult use cultivation. Okay. Or, they, or rather, let me be clear. They, they asked to see ordinance language that would allow the town to opt in. Okay. They asked to not see ordinance language that would allow the town to opt in to adult use retail stores. Okay, and that's fairly straightforward. I could do that very quickly, that kind of language. Is that the equivalent of a vote? Sorry to interrupt. Is that they the did that at a previous meeting. We had a previous, we, we did a previous, a previous <coughs> with a, meeting. With a formal that? motion and yeah. vote taken that was in, that was, a, that was a formal meeting that took place, I think, in March. March. But it was about data gathering. It wasn't a decision on those those matters, right? I actually I believe that the 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 meeting in March had a formal vote on each of the different op options, and the I recorded the tallies on each of them, yes. um, and that this group of three voted formally to not continue to explore adult use retail storefronts. Right. Right. So so we could do that. Yeah. Well, so again, I would just say for me, it's, we'll take a vote. it's an evolving conversation, and, and where we were then may be different from where we are now, but I, I'm not in a place where I feel like we have to make a change. Like, we, we had a pretty robust conversation about that. I'm comfortable with that. Yeah. I want it clear to the public, though, that we, we also talked heavily about the fact that we can, we can, op, we can exercise that other option at any point mm -hmm. that can be oh, yeah. at well, any course, point that yeah. can be changed. So I'm curious and I wonder, this is that more of a question than a comment, um, if that were like last on your list, if we could also maybe just see what that might look like um, so that we could actually have the conversation and then if we sure. decide then if we decided to uh, you know chain make chain make a change at that point we could rather than waiting two or three more months moving forward with the seven out of eight and then not having that. Does it, that, that makes sense, yeah. Okay. And I think it would be that's very easy to do. I okay. mean, so there'll so be I'm not certain... changing our position no, no, at right. this point, but I'm no, opening up sense. the door so that, that if we sense. do change, then we're not way right. behind. Can I um, so. a slight comment? Um, if I remember correctly, there was an openness from the committee that if there was an opportunity for some of those tax revenues to come back to the city, that that would be a motivating factor. Mm -hmm. uh, for possibly reconsidering that decision to opt in or not opt in. Um, and as I understand it, uh, there is an opportunity for an allocation of 25%. It's LD 3, 335. It was tabled. Yeah. Uh, That's what I said. Yeah. 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 12% for the excise tax and the cultivation and 12% on the retail. Yeah. Uh, if that were reintroduced, would that be continue to be something in the town? Money right. always talks, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. I'm always harassing our legislative delegation okay. about money for the town. So. Okay. <laughs> well, I think, I hope that by doing this, we it, it demonstrates for all of you that have come out today that, you know, we, we are still open to the conversation. You know, we formally are, you know, still only planning to entertain the seven out of eight, but um, now we'll have the additional, unless, okay, I feel good, with, good about that. Okay. Um, so let me just uh, maybe just ask a couple of questions that will help me. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, I was thinking, you know, there may be place, there may be blanks too. That's fine. Right. For example, if you have setbacks, I'm looking at Larissa's uh, yeah. note that was in the packet. Um, setbacks, I could put that in there, and and without you could add to that, for example, right? You could change mm -hmm. that um, just to get the process started. Right. Um, licensing is that something you're interested in yes. doing? Okay. Um, Odor, odor control mitigation oh, requirements. Absolutely. Distance between commercial marijuana entities. I'm curious about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious about that too. So some communities are talking about that, just, you know, uh, the distance between. Yeah. It's a density yeah. factor, and I think we've heard that uh, people have raised issues about it from a residential perspective and also have, you know, indicated concerns um, about children in residential areas and yeah the day cares so that's so that's more like distance from certain other uses I think is yes. like what you're talking right. about not between in other words with I, I didn't stores I didn't draft yeah, yeah. I didn't draft this Alyssa may want to say something about, about what that means what she meant by that yeah. but the way I read that that's like like for example in the old port there's now a distance between bars mm -hmm. well that was going to be my question right. so would you, right. that kind of thing or you know say it's in the industrial <clears> district maybe you don't care so much about that if they're if it's in a certain area where you've de deemed it to be appropriate that uh, use activity that you wouldn't that's something for you to think about it's on the list what of if you considerations. have four or five houses right next to each other all that want to grow marijuana this is only for commercial 
This is all we're not talking we're about. We're talking about commercial right now. Yeah. Um, so the the purpose of that question was the, um, we saw in the South Portland kind of language and that there is there is space for this group to talk about if if you wish to um, allow for and really this comes into play I think specifically with the retail storefronts. So yeah. if if the com this committee and then ultimately council um, passes ordinance that allows for medical marijuana retail storefronts, is there interest in seeing them? like the old port bar ordinance being spaced a certain amount of distance right. apart. Um, the argument for that, we've heard the argument against that already from some people that are here right. in the forum, but the argument for that would be to um, kind of prevent a, a row, if you will. Yeah, right. That there's Clinton Street in Binghamton, New York had right. the highest number of bars in the country. Right. <laughs> so the idea is, is simply to not create a section of town know. that is just a little trivia. In the same way that we did not embrace having an auto mile. Right, right. exactly. Yeah, I agree. Exactly. Yeah. So, anything else? So I think I he was looking for an out. answer for that question. But if I can you leave have that out for now, it sounds like, or, or put a spot for it. Put a spot okay. for it. I mean, we're, we're just going to be doing this in an iteration. We'll yeah. yeah. Sure, Maybe it so. so what you really need is something to start discussing. Yes. It sounds like. So even if it's not, all the meat's not on the bones. And, yeah. we, and what I can do to just be efficient, too, um, is is uh, glean some from the, the examples we have yeah. that either we've worked with or we're just that's aware what, of and that's just why I'd like pull to it in there and give you some options to, to whether yeah. it applies or not. I mean, I'm going to draw it in a very neutral way. So if I if it's in there, that's just because that's a type yep. of regulation sure. and you can decide yep. to keep it or not yep. keep it. Yep. Um, okay. Um, so your license is CAPS. There's obviously pros and cons to CAPS. That's the first bullet. Um, Again, that's a policy decision for the town. I will say I've worked with one town that decided to do a cap. Um, I think it's it's not the majority of towns, if I was to say. I think it's just it's it's a it's a it's a maybe you want to do it for certain things. It can be a little difficult, I think, as an administra administrator right. thing. You know, well, like, drives, how many are out there? How many are grandfathered? How do you back to you, the ground. you have you know, a version of it right now with the shellfish well, ordinance, that, quite and, frankly. You know, yeah, you know. I mean and, and the way I'm looking at it is the market's going to drive it to exactly. yeah. We're going to have an explosion and we some don't, are going to fall we, off. Right, and we don't put a limit on massage therapists or right. chiropractors. No. Or I mean, it, you'll end up, so I'll say no, I won't do that for now. We can always bring it back right. if you decide. But right. you you end up having a sort of de facto cap by your zoning. Yeah, you know, right, so, but exactly. that lets But within the market. Right. And then, so the final thing, and I will leave this blank because I think this is a discussion for future from what I'm hearing, is the zoning itself. Yeah, and that really, I think we should work with um, Jay Chase and uh, yes. and Jamal Torres in the planning department on that because you know that's what they do. Yeah, they can bring in the maps and um, help with exactly where do you, which zones you want. Mm -hmm. um, and there's two different options. As Larissa said, we could just amend the zoning ordinance mm -hmm. throughout, or you could create a new overlay, which is what South Portland did. I want to say. And which uh, no, actually, South Portland went the other route. They, they started doing they, it that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that our town planning department has suggested they would prefer for us to go the overlay, overlay route if the council is willing to support that just from a simplicity standpoint. Right. There are, our, our zoning land use code is an extremely thick and dense document and to go in and try to amend each it, it will take and I think it will be very confusing whereas if there's an overlay zone and a, a would-be grower or storefront or manufacturer will very easily be able to go and see exactly yes. where in town that business is allowed as opposed to piecemealing out through the 30 something yes. zones that we currently have. I think have. it's ideally suited for an overlay um, you, you also reduce the opportunity for missing things yes if you have to amend you know 15 different places um, mm -hmm. if marijuana, so. Yep. Okay, I'll draft this right. and register. Good luck. <laughs> Thanks. And are you open to possibly having um, two overlay districts? We had talked about that in the past, that it might not make sense to have a retail storefront overlay district in the same spaces that you have cultivation, manufacture, and um, that those are different, those are different yeah. enough uses. Like where we would not allow, for instance, um, there to be manufacture in our B3 zones, but we might be open to having retail storefronts in the B3, that there might be a space for having two separate overlays. I'd like to try to think uh, of the simpler option if there is yeah. one, and okay. we're living in a complex world, so maybe that's not a reasonable expectation, but I'd like to try to do that so we don't need a decoder ring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm out. kidding. 
you know, and we're supposed to be closest closer to it than the average person. So I, if I can't explain it, you know, we can't explain right. it. It's going to go downhill from there. I agree. Okay. I think that my the only concern I would have is is what I just said that there are some uses or commercial activities that are really well suited to certain areas of our town, yeah. but that are not suited to others, yeah. um, and that there may be some challenges with creating one overlay district to accommodate very different activities. Yeah, I understand. How I that challenging is it to show us both? I mean, it wouldn't be. I mean, we just have to have the zoning, the, the planning department create two maps. So again, for um, me, I just, I, you know, vanilla or chocolate, I like choices. I, if you can, uh, if you can provide some opportunity for yeah. us to, I think for me that's easier to <coughs> look at the pros and the cons versus mm -hmm. yeah, as long as it's here. again not crazy overburdening. Yeah. And I do agree yeah. with the simplicity piece, but sometimes sure. it might sound more complicated up front, but yeah. it actually is simpler in the long run. Well, they're closer to it, and they deal right. with all kinds yeah. of things that right. overlap and conflict with one another as it relates to subdivisions and uh, site plans. Not so so as long as you're not ready to fight, mean it's terrible. Right. Right. Okay, then we're good. Let's do that. Yeah, we can like certainly this. show you both. Yeah. Um, the question is, is what? Uh, how would you divide out the districts? And I think that I, my my initial, and I will certainly, I think that yeah. our planning department is going to be much better suited to speak to this. But my initial kind of thought is about that that B three designation. You know, when we were looking initially about where would this be, where would these different activities be well suited? A medical marijuana retail storefront is not perhaps well suited in our rural farming district. We yeah. don't allow. Right. retail storefronts in general kind right. of right so but it might be a great fit for the b3 zones yeah. whereas we might not wish to have um, manufacture and extraction taking place in our b3 zones we really want to keep that to our light industrial and industrial zones yeah. and so I just want to be sensitive to that you know there are different <coughs> activities that are these businesses need to conduct that are yeah. either a good fit or not as good a fit for the different zones that we have Like yeah, we'll think that through. I mean, at the end of the day, maybe the best thing is to amend the zoning ordinance piecemeal. Uh, you know, but Oops. but we'll see. <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, well, I'm just thinking because I mean, I mean a, as you're describing that, that gets very complicated <laughs> as an overlay district um, yeah. because a district is supposed everything in that district is supposed to be allowed, mm -hmm. right? So when you create a district, you say these are the allowed uses, and yeah. if we're gonna have different things for each of the seven categories. That gets a little more complicated in terms of an overlay district. I mean, you can do certain things that I don't always like, which is like next to the use, you can say, except on Route 1, next to this. And uh, people do that, but that's very complicated and hard to map. I think that's why we're so, talking about having maybe yeah. two overlay districts. Okay. One for more industrial activity and one for more customer okay, we'll focus. Yeah, we'll talk yeah. together. We're, we're, we're going to come to you with like strawberry too, vanilla chocolate and strawberry. Uh, and, and, we, and swirl. Like, oh, no, we're not going to go there. And, and if we could talk about um, the original thinking was we are not having ordinance in July. That's, we're not, no, we're not, sorry. Uh, August, uh, if we could have it in later August, I could do that. I, I'm away. When are you back? I get back. When is, our, when is our regular council? You, I don't know. Usually, your it's the third. Yeah, when's our? You council? would be, I believe, scheduled for council on the twenty-first. Would be my. The twenty-second's my anniversary, so I'm sorry, I'm not having an ordinance meeting on the twenty-second. Uh, you also would not have your regular staff member present for the twenty-second either. Yeah. 29th. So I'm looking at the twenty-ninth. That works for me. August twenty-ninth. What time? Four. 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 Keep it the regular time. I want. I want to be. It will be posted to the website when it's up. But August, August 29th, 4 p.m. Oh, here. <laughs> Jack. John. John, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> I know Jack Kirk hey, too. Do you know Jack Kirk? I know other Jack Kirk. Do you know? Can, can there be like a date when the town at least publishes the proposal that Attorney Saucer is developing a more in advance than a week? I mean, it, it, it does kind of take a while to kind of look at this. I'm looking at these guys. So, the so if, the, if the meeting is scheduled for Thursday, the 29th, our policy, and I, this is not going to satisfy your question, our policy would be to have it posted by the 23rd, the Friday prior to the, the next week's meeting. Um, given summer schedules and summer um, absences, I, I don't feel comfortable assuring, uh, promising a, a date earlier than that, just because um, 
Phil will have his work cut out for him and has other many other projects on his plate. And here's what I would add. We're not taking action on it that night. Oh, I know. So it is not going to be... Um, <laughs> it's going to be very draft. Uh, it, it will be <coughs> the very draft. first draft. Is that what you're making your decision, or is that just... No, no, no. Who, no we don't necessarily even process. know. I want to make sure I yeah, <laughs> it, 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 it can stress. take... Yeah, it can take a while, and this is not a small, easy one. Not that any of them are. More in process. So is the idea, once there is a first draft, including the draft and the overlay maps, that it then goes... Oh yeah, we're, we're, I'm I'm all for getting as much out in public in advance as we can, but I but I have to be mindful of my staff too and what their capabilities and time frames and availability are. So. And one thought I've had, just so you know, so the communications committee does do just quarterly um, what's called an open roundtable discussion on any issue that the public would like to see. Um, and obviously, when there are issues that we've seen are generating more and more interest, we will hopefully, you know, so I'm looking at the calendar going, September, there's one scheduled for the 24th. That might be a great opportunity, and we have we have a roundtable next Tuesday. We do. Um, yep. At 20, 6.30 at Blue Point School. at Blue Point School, so you can come out and we can talk, start the conversation there, um, but also um, I'll talk with the rest of the committee about that. The 24th is, is one. There's one this Tuesday at, at where, Wentworth Blue or Blue Point, Point School. Blue Point. Are they posted online? Uh, they are posted online, they are posted um, online. from 6 to 8. Well, I, but, and I think it's an education think that's process. The wrong I mean, again, it's like the conversation right. that we've had here yeah. today. Yeah. You hear both right. sides of it. And sometimes it's a little easier because we're actually at a table and it's not so structured. Yeah. Uh, also, from a, we had discussed at a previous meeting, um, I think that there was interest in, and staff certainly would support and make sure this came to fruition. Once, um, and now that we we're looking at a slightly different timeline and a, a rough draft coming to this committee, August 29, um, I think that we could look at late September, maybe after the next yeah. one of the ordinance committee meets, late September to mid October, hosting two public information yes. sessions specific to the proposed draft, the proposed overlay districts, um, and those can get put out to the public well ahead of time before those meetings, allow for public comment outside of the ordinance mm -hmm. committee meeting, um, and allow for public discussion, questions and answers, so that when you come to that October ordinance committee meeting, you're in a better position having heard a lot of feedback, having met with the draft that Phil's going to create for us twice at that point to maybe um, be in a, a more comfortable position to maybe make some formal action as an right. ordinance committee. If people haven't figured this out yet, my, as the chair of this committee, my, my philosophy is that I don't want to rush ordinances because they impact on people's lives. I see us as like the saucer that you put the hot tea into and then you try to cool it down and try to work with it and get the input as much as you can from folks because I'm also not a big one on, you know, regulating everything in the world. You know, that's not a good way to live either. So just so you know that that's, that's why it's we're taking our time and get it right. You guys made it clear at the last meeting that you want to do it once and you want to do it right. Exactly. And I think we can all, I mean, at least the handful of us that have been to 10 or 15 of these meetings over the last year plus, I'd have to say this is the biggest progress far and away over the last month or two. Thanks. So, Takes time. It's all we're asking. Yes. And I know you guys are under, you know, you, yeah. you've got businesses really you're running invested, too. Exactly. So, and, and I yeah. think even the people that are I get that. understood that. So I'm a business person too. I get that. Absolutely. I just want to add one thing in terms of process, yeah. just to remind people who may remember it, is that because it's a zoning ordinance, this also has to go to the planning board. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's a whole process yeah. after this. Yeah. I mean, we're yeah. just the beginning, yeah. folks. The planning board has to <laughs> hold a public okay. hearing under the st uh, statute and, and ordinance, so that's another opportunity for a different group to weigh in and, and for the public to weigh in. That's, that's further down the road. That's when you have yeah. an actual ordinance. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Were you going to wait? Um, and <laughs> She's sitting here patiently with her. To face. that point, um, we have, you know, consistently put out speculative, estimated timelines. Um, I want to just kind of, 
I want to update that speculative, tentative timeline based on the decisions that were made today because of the planning board requirement, yeah. followed by the first reading town council, public hearing town council, second reading town council. We're in January of 2020 at this point. Okay, so for those of you keeping track of the, t of the timeline um, discussion, we had at the last meeting hypothesized it was possible we'd be through council by mid-December. That is no longer an option. And so um, we will be looking at January as the earliest possible second vote by council. But we want to get there. I mean, we definitely want to get there. I, I would just recommend to the committee that, as you know, there are people planning businesses. Yeah, and, there, and there's limited real estate for all. I know. And so if it would be helpful that um, maybe at the next meeting we have a little bit better understanding of maybe the direction. Not necessarily we have the ordinances, but we feel pretty confident that we're going to go this route because I do know um, that there are people looking to come into Scarborough because right. there's real estate here, there's warehouses that are empty. Right. And you know, I think that they're concerned that the level of investment they're going to have to make is so substantial. Right. They don't want to do it, then you guys say, no, no, we're not doing this, and then they've well, I, to, to that point, I field a number of calls each week, and what I have said very clearly to everyone who has called me, the Ordinance Committee is one step in the process. They have indicated interest in seeing language that does not commit them to adopting that language as an Ordinance Committee, and then from there it needs to go to the full council, who has not had a chance to weigh in on this at all. So what I have said to, I hope every business person has heard me say this to them that has called, you as business people, of course, should make the decisions for your business that you feel are best for your business, but you would be speculating in, in Scarborough. You have, there is nothing that has happened in Scarborough to, that should be informing you in a positive direction at this point. This is an open conversation, and we do not wish for people to be investing in Scarborough to be disappointed later. And I would just add, I would just add to that, so one of the things so. when you're sitting behind the table, um, and to Jean Marie's point, um, we get it. We know you're under pressure, so are we, but that's not going to expedite or speed us up anymore. We actually just sped up the timeline by a month, believe it or not, in the last uh, 10 minutes. So sometimes you got to take the small wins and continue to roll with it and work with us um, because I've seen something like this start to gain ground and gain tension. So just be mindful of that and keep the lines of communication open. Hmm. All right. I think we had one more person who wanted to speak. Yes. If, what? On. Oh, so we're are, we're done with marijuana. <laughs> and I know we have a gentleman here who had a question or something about the good neighbor ordinance, but to do with noise. So if anyone wants to stay and listen to that, otherwise let's give them a minute and then you can talk. <laughs> Where you are a very expensive so, member of this team. Do you want to exit? Sure. Happy to. Please pop out. My kids. Yes. Yeah. Luckily, they're my brothers. They, uh, awesome. uh, they made it so medical of drug dealers to serve nice. out of state patients without any other paperwork now. So it's kind of opened up the whole medical. Yeah, I got to get caught like up as to what's so, going on. Like guys yeah. like me who have a store in Scarborough can take me on a run out and grab one in car. Yeah, I was going to say, we must go. We don't look at Dale Street. Yeah. Now you they can enjoy your summer and eventually become like alcohol, which was back in the 20s, into the whatever. Thank you, Phil. You want your homework, right? Call me, Phil. I excused Phil because he's expensive. Jean Marie, I asked him to go because he's expensive, and it seemed like we were down. Phil, I asked him to clock out. Okay. Yes. I don't care. All right. We go? right. We got one more thing. All right. We have one. We're going off for one one item, and then we're going to be adjourning because I have to go back to work. <laughs> I work. I you know I have a job. <laughs> My name is Cliff Bolton. If you could pick up the, the, the microphone okay. for us. My name is Cliff Bolton. I live at 15 Moss Road in Scarborough down at Little Point. I, I'm sorry, what street do you live on? Uh, 15 Ross Road. Ross, okay. Yep. Okay. I live a pretty, pretty 
pretty far from Bailey Campground. And I have tried for years to get them to quiet down. My house rattles, I've had the police down, I've had a council member down, everybody agrees that as the ordinance is written, it is being violated. I had the police down Saturday night, and she said it was violated, but they have a, a um, special, special entertainment. Special, yep. Right. Now, it seems that the way that it's interpreted by the enforcement thing is that if you have a permit, I don't have any rights as stated in the purpose of the good neighbor ordinance. I mean, they can make as much noise as they want, as many nights as they want, and I have no rights at all, and I feel that's unfair. I'm at the point where I don't want to be part of that entertainment. Mm -hmm. A good summer night, I cannot have guests. Mm -hmm. I cannot go to bed early. Uh, I have to hold up if I want to watch TV behind closed doors and closed windows. And I don't feel it's fair. You've sacrificed my right to be protected by the good neighbor ordinance by issuing permits. Okay. And I don't see why I am over 500 feet away. I don't feel why I should have to be any part of their entertainment. Mm -hmm. And I can't get it enforced. Um, Last year, I was at a council meeting and we talked it over mm -hmm. amongst all of you. You said they must obey the law. You have to send out uh, copies of the Good Neighbor Ordinance with the permit. That's fine. But nobody seemed to notify the enforcement, mm -hmm. you know, that they had to obey the law. And I'm asking you people, uh, you know, and you get it obeyed. Okay. Thank you. Do you? All right. Marissa. Do you wish to speak to that or not speak to that right now? Um, I, I don't. Uh, this is something that I would like to discuss in August. Okay. If we so have this time. to go on on our August agenda. Uh, yeah, briefly, anyway. <laughs> Why are you looking at me? <laughs> because, no, because, because the August, my, here's where I'm coming from with this. I understand, you know, noise, it's irritating. I hear Beach Ridge Speedway, uh, where I live. We do. Uh, yeah, I know you me do. Me too. I used to. Yeah? Oh, yeah. So, this is, this is something that's going to need probably some tweaking, but it's, Nothing's going to happen between now and the end of, the end of season. yeah, exactly. So let's move this to September. Let's put this on okay. September ordinance. Can I speak to that, though? Yep. So nothing's going to happen in terms of us being, uh, having an ability right. to take action. Right. I do think we can have the conversation and we can have some law right. enforcement come in and let us give us a report September. back uh, as to how yep. the summer has gone. Yep. Um, I mean, we've got a few good months. By the end of, by August 29th, there'll have been a lot of summer gone. I've actually am the one who has sat in Cliff's house mm -hmm. with the windows and the doors closed, mm -hmm. and um, we couldn't even have a conversation mm -hmm. inside his house. And so here's the thing. Yes, we can wait on the conversation, but mm -hmm. the ordinance is in play, mm -hmm. and if they are violating, then they need to be issued a... Um, they need to be issued a, uh, uh, a summons. summons. Absolutely. We do a lot of so, yeah. Well, this is 10. This, this is, is 10. well, 9 o'clock. All right, Laura. So, okay, so um, two, we did have Officer Thompson uh, went to go visit Mr. Moulton's property. She wrote up a, a really excellent, detailed report about her experience. I asked her. Yeah, and she did. She did a very good job with that report. Um, I pulled the special amusement permit for Bailey's campground on Monday because of that report to see if they had been exempted from the good neighbor ordinance. So just as kind of to catch everybody up. Having a special amusement permit does not, right. in a, does not by itself exempt you from the good neighbor ordinance. There is a section on the permit application that asks you if you believe that you should be exempted from the good neighbor ordinance to tell the town the 
extent of the exemption you are seeking, and the justification for the request. Right. On the Bailey's application, it lists as the time for the music from 7 to 9 p.m. I believe that Ms. Thompson's report was at 8 p.m. So it was within the time that was, a, that was permitted for music to be playing, amplified. They did check off amplification. The gray area where we are right now is on that application, um, and I went and I back and I watched the meeting again that you guys had when you um, authorized these applications. So I, I, I went and I, I watched the entire meeting again to, to make sure that this... Not a greatest hits night. Um, it was a great night. It was a great night. Um, Come on. But the, this application was actually referenced very briefly. There was extended conversation about Bailey's bait shed, not about Bailey's campground. Um, but there was a very brief reference to it. It was one of the four applications that had been pulled and looked right. at specifically. And it was pointed out that, yes, they had written in on the request to be exempted, but they didn't actually, and this wasn't part of the conversation, that, um, they did write, we've been in business 36 years. That was what they wrote on, uh, I don't I, here, sir, I understand. They wrote that that was what was written on their, on their permit application. Where we stand from a town as far as enforcement challenge, so this has been a topic of a number of days' worth of conversation. I want you to know that you were heard. We are trying to figure out how to best address your concerns while also respecting the vote of council. I think that there is space to interpret council's passage and granting of that, condition, of that special amusement permit where they filled in language under the exemption part. They checked off they were going to be amplified. They said 7 to 9, comma, sometimes 9.30. And then they put in, we've been in business for 36 years. I, I think we're in a gray area as far as whether or not council agreed to exempt them from the good neighbor ordinance by passing that growth permit application. Uh, not growth, sorry, confusing topic. <laughs> by granting that <laughs> special amusement permit application. On the other side, where you could argue is that the, they, they did not follow the directions on the permit application. They did not tell us how they wished to be exempted or to the extent of, or, or the justification. I have a question. I want you to okay. The good neighbor ordinance, if where we could choose to enforce, and this is a big if, okay, because of council action at the last meeting, the good neighbor ordinance says that um, the, that noise cannot be la um, unreasonably loud or unreasonable. Right. Okay. Officer Thompson's report made very clear that this was an unreasonable Reasonable. level of right. noise. However, the special amusement permit and the, the good neighbor right. ordinance is very clear. You are not held to that standard if you have been permitted by the town. Right. And this is where our conflict comes in. Did the council action on the Bailey's right. Campground permit application with there being language in the section requesting exemption, even if it wasn't clear that that's what they were doing, there was written language there, did council exempt them through that vote? And even if, so, and if that wasn't council's intention, I don't know if that matters if the act has exempted them. So we're in this kind of odd area. So what I, I met with, um, Sergeant, go ahead. Can I ask my question? So my understanding, because there were some that I had kind of pulled out and looked at separately, and some of, and they, some of them were somewhat incomplete, and some like that one I remember very specifically because it says sometimes 9:30, and I, if I remember correctly, I made a comment up to the fact that, you know, this isn't correctly filled out because it says sometimes 9:30, and that is a violation because on some nights it's it's before then, right? If it was no, a, it's ten on Friday. And that's Saturday, what I'm saying. And nine. If, Right, so they don't, they didn't specify on the application which days. So if they were to play till 9.30, for example, on a Wednesday or a, a different day, then they're in violation. So that I thought what was happening from that point was the direction was given that they were, that Todi was going back and having those all refilled out. She did. Okay. Uh, she did or not. She so, to, and or I, she was going to. Well, that's actually, I, I don't. Thought. That's think that, what I thought. I don't think that that is. I. You did ask a question. If, if the, so the council, of course, cannot direct Tody. Okay, yeah, so you, right. you did ask a question about if that was an option to have happen. The council didn't take an action requesting that to have happen. I, I, I heard you ask the question very clearly. I well, don't I wanted believe to make sure they knew that they couldn't go till nine thirty. You know, everyone wants to do the right thing, they say, and yet if they don't know that they're doing something wrong, they don't know. They should know because, 
Yep. So I think that we're in kind of a gray area because the council did act, the council did grant those permits. So even if we ask them to be more clear after the fact, the permit has been granted. That's right. So I'm, I think that we're in kind of an odd area here. To that point, though, about people needing to know what they should be doing and, and making sure that everyone is aware of the rules, I met with Sergeant O'Malley today, soon to be Deputy Chief O'Malley, um, and I've asked oh, him. Cool. Yep, know. I've asked him to go and meet with Bailey's Campground, and to remind them of kind of the the standards and, and the rules, and to and to ask the question: Are you being a good neighbor? Are you? I'm not. Okay. <laughs> I know, but we need to look. So, yeah. but there's a, but there is this larger question, and Tom and I spoke about this at length on Tuesday. I, I don't know what real teeth the town has to enforce the good neighbor ordinance, where the permits were granted and there was language written on the permit application. So I, well, maybe, maybe not for me. And my question is this. I go out and I, I don't know, whatever, whoever I'm applying for, I'm applying for my driver's license and I fill out my application wrong, right? Can, does the state have the right to deny my driver's license? Yes. yes okay. Do. So these people are applying for something in our town that is a special privilege. And granted, we went ahead and voted on it, but the application was not filled out correctly and in fact implied that they, some of the things that the, on that application, which was my point that night, why I was almost hesitant to, to vote at all and wanted to pull some of those out so that they could be Remember. corrected and then we could vote the very next meeting but I, there was a lot of pressure not to do that so I mean I we I we absolutely could this could be a, a council uh, agenda the next time now do I think that's the right way to go I don't know that I think that's well, the right way to go but to completely ignore it and wait for two more months to go by I think is wrong too well I if I to me, this isn't, well, this could be at the level where it does need to go back to the council, that it doesn't need to even be an ordinance right. at this point. That's what I'm saying. We, that's an option. So. To clarify the decision on this one permit? No, on the whole. Yeah, we could just have it as an agenda item right. to discuss. Um, I, 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 I prefer things to get somewhat vetted. I mean, my, one of my thoughts was, is like, with these permits, do we layer in something where you know you have three consecutive incidences within you know whatever a four week time period bam you lose your permit um your your what's that no 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 I, I know it's not now what i'm saying is that that could be the conversation and so that would be that would be a little bit cumbersome i think right. to do at the full council level um which is why i was suggesting maybe we talk about how we could you know and i'd like to hear from the police on, on it as well see what well they i the reason why i'm saying i would rather put it at the end of the season whether preferably september because i think we're going to have a full thing in august is that in september we will know more about what has gone on what needs to happen or what excuse me please um is um because the, the the council was pretty clear in granting what they granted, in my opinion, um, and nothing. So we talk about it. Say we talk about it in August. Nothing's going to happen because then it has to go to council. Unless you go right to council in July. I, I think we have issues with this. Two levels. One is I, I think it was not clear what what was really decided, and uh, we didn't execute the review uh, of those permits very well. They weren't filled out very well. We didn't see them ahead of time. We only looked at some of them, and now you have a good example of one that there's questions about how mm -hmm. a single one that was actually filled out pretty well as we're having difficulties with enforcement. Mm -hmm. So I see this at two levels. One is you know what is what does the ordinance really say, and how can it be enforced? Mm -hmm. And the second is how are we executing? Mm -hmm. And we, we get F's on both of those, you know, uh, mm -hmm. on this round, I say. So I was the only guy who voted against yeah, approving yeah. those. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess the purpose of, of so why I wanted to share that with you is that, first, like Mr. Moulton, I wanted you to hear that you have been the topic of yes. sincere concern <laughs> and, and discussion this week of, on many different levels of your local government. You were heard, you were seen, and we're trying to figure out how we can respect your personal property rights and your right to enjoy your property. 
at the same time, we are, are restricted in what we can do because of what has, been, ha what has happened to date. And so I, I guess I just wanted to share with you three, because it's, right. it's going to come before you again, whether it's August or September. Right. But I also really wanted you to hear, Mr. Moulton, since you took the time to come and speak to right. one of our council committees, right. we're trying to think about how to meet your needs, while at the same time respecting the action that the council took and the, the business owner's expectation as a result of that action. It's, I understand that it's ugly, and I'm very sorry. I really, truly am. We're, we're trying to find how to serve you, and I'm not sure that we're going to meet your satisfaction this summer. And for that, I'm sincerely sorry. Well, yeah. at least something's being done, and you know, the purpose of it is specific. And yet, when you give the permit, I am denied protection right. of that prefix. So let, let's, let's do this. Because uh, I do need to go. I hate to run around my schedule, but occasionally it happens. It's been a full meeting. It's been a full meeting. Um, is what would you prefer? Do you want to he he talk more about it in August? Sept here are here are your choices: August, September, or go or go to. Can I make a motion? Well, let me just give you my ideas, or go directly to council. Uh, I'd like to make a motion. Oh, go ahead. That we revisit in its entirety uh, the the uh, special amusement permit process as part of the good neighbor ordinance uh, to be addressed uh, by this committee uh, next in a meeting in August, and we decide at that time how deep, wide, and far we might want to go with reviewing the ordinance and related issues, including enforcement or lack thereof. Okay. That I know is a very long motion. <laughs> that is a long motion. But, but that's it's okay. basically to look at I will enforcement second it, and the waste written. And I will add that I will commit to spending some dedicated time so that I don't just come here to chat about it, but that I actually have some ideas. That would be good. And if you would let... Um, Can we take a vote? Yes. <laughs> Not much of something that's better. Not that's pertinent to the... All those in agreement. All right, okay. August. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm okay. sorry. In I'm losing you right In now. order to <laughs> facilitate that education piece, like, please, let me know what you need. I'm happy to pull together any information you need to further that conversation or to inform your, your thoughts on the matter. Let me know what you need, and um, I will get that to you well before that August meeting so that you'll have plenty of time at the beach to read through it. <laughs> you might want to add roosters to that list of issues. No, not in August. Stay off the roosters for the moment. Just okay. kidding. Just kidding. All right. Uh, motion to adjourn. Second. Third. Second. All, All in favor. favor. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Offline. So if there's a um, uh, special entertainment, I don't know if you want to. Are the neighbors alerted to it to come from public opinion?